Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the last in our series of webinars focused on teaching with the arts during the pandemic. My name is Rebecca Edwards. I'm the education specialist for teacher programs in the Getty Museum's education department, and I'll be your host for this webinar. Our program for today focuses on the relationship between movement, play, and art, and explores ways that they can be used in your teaching to engage students. Our hope is that via this webinar, you'll be able to make moments in your classroom that are infused with art, even in the core subject classroom where the content standards and pacing guides may already keep you very busy. We recognize that this moment in time is very unique for teachers. Some of you remain remote, while in other schools, students are back in person, and yet many other classrooms are hybrid right now. As we develop the content for this program, we tried to keep in mind the variations. And while not everything will work in every classroom situation, our hope is that you'll find flexibility in our ideas that you can apply to your particular setting. We also decided to leave out movement-based classroom activities that we thought would be too challenging to do in an environment where student social distancing is still a priority. Before we get started, I'd like to cover a few practical details for the webinar. First, you'll notice that I've turned on closed captioning. If you prefer not to see it, you can go to your Zoom doc and select hide closed captioning. Second, I'd like to bring your attention to the Q&A window. Please feel free to enter your questions and comments there. We'll leave time at the end of the webinar to share your comments and answer any questions that you may have. I also wanted to let you know that we'll be sharing the slides from the webinar along with resources and a list of links referenced during the presentation. We'll share the link to these files with you shortly via the chat, stay tuned. We will also include the same link in a follow-up email in case you miss it. Lastly, we're very excited to be able to offer a free copy to all webinar participants of Ready, Set, Go, the Kinesthetic, Kinesthetic Classroom 2.0. We hope this book will support your efforts to include movement in your classroom. We're able to make these books available for free thanks to a generous grant from the Genesis Inspiration Foundation. In this time of challenge, the Genesis Inspiration Foundation recognizes the difficulties that many educators are facing and kindly offer to support this webinar through the free distribution of educational materials. I'll be sharing information at the end of the webinar about how to provide us with your mailing address if you'd like to receive your free copy of the book. I'll be getting started today with an overview of the content that we'll be covering, as well as some short and simple strategies that we will hopefully get your thinking percolating. We'll then be following with two speakers who will be covering our topic with more in-depth ideas and examples. So to get us started, I'd like to go ahead and share my screen. So let's start by talking about ways that movement can enrich your classroom. For the purposes of this webinar, I've narrowed it down to five general categories of ways that you can use movement in your classroom, but there are certainly more. For starters, you can use it to energize students and create a kind of a community within your classroom. You can also use it to establish routines for classroom management. So I bet a lot of you already do that. It's also helpful for cultivating social emotional learning, which will be so important as students are transitioning away from the pandemic. It can be used to build and support content learning, very important, and also to support student skill building. So what are some of the, con some of the connections between movement, art, and play? So first off, movement can build an understanding of art, and art can serve as a vis visual cue for action. Additionally, movement in itself is a form of play. 
and imitating movement that you see in art can also inspire more understanding of the art, the content, and inspire empathy for the characters or persons in represented in the art. So with that, let's focus for a moment on the first of these categories, which is energizing students and creating community. So for the purposes of this webinar, I focused on works of art in the Getty collection, of course, because we're the Getty Museum and we know that art and that collection very well. But please don't feel constrained by our use of images from the Getty collection. Certainly these ideas can be used with art from all different museums and art that you find on the web or that you have yourself as well. So to get us started, one way to energize students is to use art as a visual cue, like a virtual dance break. Here are a couple examples. You could even choose to play some music while you're looking at these. You could choose your favorite or choose another. And when you put this image up, either in your in-person classroom or on your virtual classroom or in some combination of those, it lets students know it's time to take a dance break. Here's another approach, especially for younger students who can certainly benefit for some, from some wiggle time. Use art to inspire different kinds of wiggling, like this one, Irises by Vincent Van Gogh. You could get everybody to sway like the irises. You might even ask, say the breeze is gentle, how are the irises moving? What about if the wind picks up? What does their movement look like then? You could also use an image like this one and have everybody climb like a monkey. Or hop like a grasshopper, creep like a caterpillar, or fly like a butterfly. You choose the image that you like. You can use it regularly in your classroom so your students know that anytime they see that image, it's time to do their wiggle time. Here's one flapping like a bird. Now let's talk about the ways that you can use art and movement to establish routines for class time, classroom management. For example, the images that one finds in works of art can help to signal that it's time for these routines. My favorite, I'm sure everybody reaches a moment in their class when it's time for everybody to quiet down a little bit. Here's a great one. It's sleepy cat time. Shh. I'm sure you do a lot of celebrating, both of class accomplishments and student accomplishments. I love fireworks fingers like that. You can add sound effects. You can pick a fireworks image to get the idea across that it's time for fireworks fingers. Sometimes you need to shift gears or take a pause. Taking a breath is a great way to do that. It might be an in-breath or an out-breath. You could take a beautiful still life of flowers like this one and imagine reaching into the painting. Find your favorite flower. I'm picking a tulip. Grab it out of the painting. Bring it over to your nose and take a deep breath in. Smell its wonderful fragrance. Or you could practice breathing out. For example, you could imagine blowing up a balloon, taking a deep breath out. Or you could blow a gust of air to put out a candle like this one. Sometimes it's great to shift gears with a stretch break. While some of these approaches work specifically well with elementary students, I think even older students might like to have a stretch. I even like to. You could pick a tree or a cactus and imagine stretching like the tree in the shape of the tree. It could be one that you see outside. It could be one that's in a work of art. It could also be a tall building. Take a big stretch. You can also use works of art to signal transitions to different subjects. You can find works of art that signal transitions to science, history, English language arts, art, of course. Take this one, for example, a tapestry of astronomers studying the sky. You could pull this image up and make telescope hands. Time for science. Or 
In this portrait, we see a man reading a very big book. You could have an accompanying gesture of opening a book, reading time. Sometimes it's take, time to take a break for snack or lunch, to say goodbye for a little while and transition to another room or to end your Zoom. How about a image with lots of delicious fruits like this one? You could choose a grape, a pomegranate, one of those delicious looking berries. Reach into the painting. I'm going to choose a grape. Pull it out, take a bite. If you'd like to join along with me at any point, feel free to try some of these ideas out yourself. I know that another routine that can be really helpful for some classrooms is sensory activities, especially for students that might have sensory issues or need a little extra support in that area. You can use works of art to inspire a sensory activity. For example, this hare in the forest or this squirrel. You could imagine, what is it like to pet that fur on the hair? Run your, imagine running your hand, petting it. Imagine how it feels, soft, smooth. Or imagine running your hand up the fur of that squirrel's tail. Maybe find something soft or fluffy that you have in your environment. Students can run their hands over it, just imagining like it's the hair or the squirrel. How does it feel? Or instead of something soft and furry, how about a hedgehog? How do you think it would feel to touch this hedgehog? Would you pet it in the same way as the rabbit? Find something that might feel the same way. Run your hands over it. How does it feel? This one, maybe not all teachers will want to use, but in the right space with the right classroom and maybe they're, or at home, Students could even try using a work of art like this to inspire a twirl. I'm not going to do it now, though you're welcome to try it. Or if the students need another kind of activity, try a jumping break. So now let's talk a little bit about using the arts and movement to cultivate social emotional learning. So we're going to keep it simple for today share a few images that reflect emotions. Certainly, especially at this time where a lot of us have a lot of feelings about what has been going on. Looking at works of art that are portraits that show different kinds of expressions are a great way to help students think about understanding others and identifying the feelings that they're experiencing as well. Different portraits have different challenge levels. Some of these like the sad boy in the middle most likely any student would be able to make sense of. Some of them, like The Vexed Man by Messerschmitt, can be a little bit more comp complicated and can take you in even the middle school and high school classroom to talk, for students to talk about what might be going on with that man's expression. You can also try mimicking the expressions that you see in art. Try them on. What does it feel like to make that expression? What does it tell you about the person that you see in the work of art? What does it tell you about how they might be feeling? You can also show on your face how you might be feeling right now. Looking at works of art is a great way to help students start to develop their own sense of empathy and to learn how to communicate the feelings that they're having at any given moment. So for the remainder of this webinar, we have two other important areas where we'd like to explore movement and play. One is using these activities, these kinds of activities for building on content learning that is much more curriculum linked than the kinds of classroom management strategies that I've just shared. Other approaches are really supportive of skill building activities, perhaps learning to analyze an image, building on writing skills, and so on. So for the remaining part of this webinar, we're going to transition to our two speakers, Elliot Kaiki and Darcy Beeman Black, and they'll be covering with examples and more in-depth activities, these two areas. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and transition to my colleague, Elliot Kaiki, who will be talking about playing with art. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Elliot Kaiki, and I've been a museum educator at the Getty for more than 25 years. And during that time, I've really had only one goal, and that's really which has remained the same, which is to get people excited about art. Um, it's not always the easiest thing to do, um, get people excited about art, but I'm going to try to, today, I'm going to try to make a few suggestions um, that um, for maybe some unexpected ways to get excited about art and also for you to get your students excited about art too. Um, perhaps you found your way to a museum website or, or two and, and explored some of the objects on the websites and maybe found objects that you can use in your teaching in some way. Um, but um, have thought about the problem of how to engage your students with the art um, this is not an always easy thing to get them to look carefully, to, um, to talk about the art, to wonder about the art. Um, it's hard to get students to, it's hard to figure out how to get them to enter the work of art and to, so that they can explore what they find once they've entered the work of art. So um, I think it's because art can be, art can be really intimidating to some people. Um, it's, it, it's intimidating to us and, and, and our students both. So, and I think it's in part because we tend to ask the wrong question when we start. And I think the question that we, that sort of stumps us is um, that question, what do I have to know about the art? It's as if I have to know a lot of things. And I think that's one of the reasons we hear from people about museums that they don't like museums because, or they don't go to museums because, you know, I don't know anything about art, so I don't go to museums. Um, so I think, and then in fact, people ask me um, at the museum, do you know everything about these, everything in this museum? And of course, I, I have to reply and laugh actually that um, there's more that I don't know about the things in the museum than I do know. Now, I don't want to suggest that you shouldn't know anything about art, but I do want to suggest that there's a different place to start with the art than asking yourself what you should know about it. Um, so instead of asking, what should I know? I suggest we ask, what do I do with this artwork? Or rather, what do we do about it? Um, so that puts us in the active mode, but more than that, it puts in, us into a kind of playful mode. Um, and, um, what I mean by this is think about children when they first when they first encounter a playground, a new playground, they um, intuitively or, or kind of naturally know what to do or how to explore the playground, how to figure out how to do things with what's in the playground, how to operate what's in the playground. And so I think about play as that kind of freedom that they have to um, move around and operate. And, and figure out how to use what's in the playground. Now, I've tried to do that um, in the museum. I've, I suggested that museums are playgrounds and galleries are kinds of playgrounds. And um, I've met a little resistance to that. But I think that if you think about your class, I'll bet you've thought about your classroom many times as a kind of playground. And so um, what happens? Let's talk about what happens if you introduce artwork into your classroom or artwork into the playground and ask, what do we do with these artworks when we introduce them? So I'd like to show you a couple of examples of what's, what's possible. I'm gonna share my screen, so here we go. Um, I wanna show you a painting by an artist named Nicholas Poussin. This is a painting that was created in about 1650. Um, it's a landscape um, and um, the first thing, the natural thing, what do we do with this is the first the natural thing is we look at it and um, maybe we talk about it too. And there's plenty to see here. It's full of um, nature. It's full of the earth, sky, mountains, animals. Um, there's actually a few things going on. There's a man watching his goats. There's a man riding his horse furiously out of the picture. And there's even a little fire in the background. Um, there's um, a huge building in this uh, picture and it raises questions about 
um, the relationship between man and nature in this picture. It's, you know, we could, we could ask that question, which, which dominates what in this picture? Is it man or is it nature that dominates this scene? But I'd like to suggest a, a little different way of talking about and uh, of dealing with this painting, and that's to ask what we can do with it. So, and I think one of the clues to, or one of the answers could be um, suggested by the picture at the bottom here. And I think you can see that there's a pathway at the very bottom of this picture that asks us to actually walk into the picture. And so what I, what I do with students and what I suggest we could do is accept this invitation to go walk in the picture. Um, but we have to prepare ourselves a little bit. So um, I would ask you to stand up. If you want to join me in this um, adventure, I'd ask you to stand up. And I ask the students just to feel the way their feet touch the ground or the floor. And feel the way that your body meets the earth in that way. And then just lean a little bit forward and feel the way your toes um, grab onto the ground and then lean back a little bit and feel the way your heels dig into the ground. And just stand a little bit and just feel the, your feet against the ground. And so once we prepared our feet, we'll start our, a little walk into this painting. We'll accept that invitation and just walk down the path a little bit. And let's talk about how that dirt feels under our feet as we walk. And if you wanna take your shoes off, you can really feel it. You feel the dirt. And what does it feel like as we walk along this path here? And then we encounter a couple of goats along this path in our way. And so we'll have to figure out how to get around these goats. And my favorite goat who actually is the only goat who knows we're here, looking straight at us, actually. But we should also stop and, and just have a little smell. What does it smell like in this picture? And um, what do we hear in this picture as we walk down? Because we'll just keep walking a little bit and we'll walk down by the water. I think when you go to the water, you know, shall we put our hands in the water, just feel your fingers a little bit, get them ready and put your fingertips in the water. And what's the water like? Um, is it cold? You know, what is the temperature here? And then if you want, you can stick your toes in, into the water as well. So this is a picture that has a long way to walk in. So we could walk along this little lake there's a lot to notice in the lake. There's the reflections. And we'll hear, as we walk by this man on the horse, we'll hear him galloping away. And we'll walk back further and further. And it'll be up to you in your class to decide how far you wanna walk, whether you wanna walk to the building or even farther into the distance, or you could even walk up the mountain. So, Students have an ama amazing imagination. Obviously, we're not really walking, but they have an amazing imagination. One time when I told the class we'd be walking into the painting, one of the students stopped me and asked, how are we gonna get out of the painting? So um, this was just one example um, of the possibilities. And I wanna show you another example of something slightly different. This is a painting by a German artist named Hans Hoffmann. Um, this is a picture called The Hare in the Forest. And it was painted earlier than that Poussin painting that was painted about 1585. And um, here there's a lot to see and talk about as well. Um, um, there's this dense forest and it's full of creatures and plants. So, um, if you look really carefully, and this is one thing you can do on Zoom actually, is you can see the cricket there. 
and and there's there's all kinds of things. There's a, this wonderful lizard. See his legs, and then um, as we go further, there's a beetle, and so um, they're kind of camouflaged because when you first look at this picture, it's hard to see the branches and the animals, how to separate them. But it's a wonderful, wonderful scene of the trees with broken branches and bark. And there's this sort of, um, there's, there's a, if we look carefully, there's like a little wasp and there's an, an ant. There's everything to talk about with respect to nature. But um, what I'd like to suggest is that this picture also asks us to do, to do things. And one of the things I would do is to get, to get us ready with our hands. So let's just get our fingertips ready and our hands up. And when you're ready, think about reaching in and picking up something in this picture. You have to decide what you wanna pick up. And then very carefully just lean in and pick it up gently though, because you don't wanna crush whatever it is you picked up and hold it. And let's talk about what you picked up. You know, it's like, did someone pick up the lizard and what does it feel like in your hand? Or did someone, was somebody feeling strong today and pick up the bunny and hold it and tell us what that fur feels like against your skin. So, um, um, and that could go on and on because I've had um, young students tell me about how they love to pick up lizards and how sometimes the tail comes off when they pick it up. So this is just a couple things, walking in the, in, in the Pusan or reaching in to the Hoffman that um, you can do um, that involves something very physical for the painting. I would say that when you choose to do something with an artwork, this approach works best when you let the artwork guide you. So um, it's best if you ask, what does this picture or this artwork, it can be a three-dimensional artwork as well, what does the artwork allow you to do with it? What does the artwork even ask you to do with it? Um, what is it even begging me to do with it? So in sum, um, we started out with that question, with that question, you know, what do I need to know about the artwork? But I suggested that we move um, to a different question, which is what do we do with the artwork? And even beyond that, letting the artwork guide us, what is the artwork allowing me to do with it? Or what is the artwork even asking me to do with it? So, and, you know, you and your students can puzzle these questions out because the artworks obviously don't speak directly to you, but if you puzzle these questions out a little bit, you'll come up with all sorts of things. And that's what makes artworks such a rich subject um, to explore. So thank you very much. Thank you, Elliot. Um, that was a great presentation. We really enjoyed it. Um, I'd like to go ahead now and introduce our next speaker, Darcy Beeman Black. And Darcy Beeman Black is the Associate Education Specialist for Teacher Programs at the Getty Museum. Um, and previously, she was the Youth Programs Coordinator at the Metal Museum in Memphis, Tennessee. She'll be building a little bit on Elliot's presentation by sharing some extensions of how you can use that activity to build on content and skill learning in your classroom. She'll then be going on to share another project that you can do that involves documentary photographs. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and invite Darcy to join our webinar. Thank you, Rebecca. And hello, everybody. I am very happy to be here. And I am going to share with you um, before I get into the project that I am going to share for my portion, I do want to add a little bit to what Elliot shared today. And I'm just gonna uh, show this slide of ways 
to connect playing with art to the, your curriculum. So, you know, Elliot, um, some of his, uh, or the activities that he was showing can really connect to your curriculum if you uh, focus on your uh, artwork choices that you use for the activity, so, or for playing. So for example, uh, we saw a hare in the forest that exhibits a particular habitat. Uh, you know, you could choose a different habitat that you're studying with your class. Um, I am gonna be sharing uh, some documentary photographs that document a moment in time. And so that's one way that you can connect it, but you'll see there are some other, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but you can see that there are other ways that you can connect the uh, idea of playing with art to your curriculum. And then some activity extensions. So if you want to build on content learning and uh, based on skill building, you can uh, do some other things like writing a narrative or description. So maybe for the Pusan piece, the first piece that Elliot shared with us, you have your students write out what, their, what they did when they walked into that painting, what their experience was like, maybe um, do a descriptive story about walking down that path and what they saw. You can utilize sentence stems so you could, you know, say, I see, and then they can list out what they see. Uh, or for here in the forest, you know, scientific sketching, you could have them draw uh, after playing and see what they, what they learned from drawing. And then uh, practice visual analysis. What is this painting made out of? How was it made? How was it put together? What, what choices did the artist make to make this piece of art visually interesting. And then, so I'm going to get into a project that you can take uh, as far as you want to, but it's taking this idea of movement and uh, kind of immersing yourself into a work of art and taking those ideas and making it into a project where it could end up being a video project if you would like. So I do have the project steps here. You can go as far as you want. You could leave out uh, the video step if you just want to make it an activity where you step into the work of art. Um, I tried to make it sort of modular so you can take it as far or take pieces of it that you want that you could use. Um, but really the idea behind the project is to discover more historical discover more about a historical moment in a documentary photograph using movement. So you can create a video at the end that invokes movement and really evokes empathy, right? We're immersing ourselves and really becoming the subject in these photographs to try to create more empathy. So the first step is choose the documentary photograph. I have chosen a theme today of labor in America in the early 20th century. So we have a couple of artists or photographers in, that have pieces in the Getty Collection that really documented what work looked like in various areas of America during this time. So you can see I have a factory worker here as an example, and he's sort of beating this glass and shattering this glass and he doesn't have glasses on or anything. He's just letting that stuff go in his face. And then we have a cotton worker in the San Joaquin Valley, um, you know, kind of dragging this large bag of cotton and leaned over very probably uncomfortably picking cotton. So you can really uh, choose a documentary photograph that relates to the curriculum you're trying to uh, teach with your students. So the first step after you choose the photograph is to look closely. You know, use some of those skills of uh, looking at a photograph and sort of taking inventory. Um, you can have your students just list out everything they see sort of to start with, maybe in the chat, 
if you're teaching from a distance, they can do that or they can do a list. Maybe you can do a list as a class if you're in person. And then, you know, discuss what's happening in the photo or have the students write what they think, you know, how would you describe the photo to another person in a few sentences? Maybe that's a homework assignment or maybe it's something that you do together. And then where and when do you think this photo is taken and why? What is it about this photograph we see on the left that makes us think that it might be old, maybe because it's black and white, maybe because of the style, maybe because we know that metal workers today would never just be beating on metal without glasses on, uh, maybe the tools used. Um, so, you know, really analyzing this photo and starting, starting small and then leveling up. And then, you know, the, the, the breadth of this project that we're going into is really getting your students to think about what the subject in the photograph is thinking and then formulating their own opinions about what they think about this image. So then, you know, the, the play part, the step into the work of art, you know, you, but use movement with this, use body movement to discover what this subject is thinking, position your body to match the subject. You know, I, I mentioned earlier that that bag looks really heavy. What would that feel like? Actually have your students get up and try it. You know, they can use simple hand props if available. I actually tried this and I had a sheet that I rolled pillows up in and it was this huge bag that I had to figure out how to move around and it wasn't even heavy. So that really gave me some more information about what this subject might be going through. Um, use your senses. What does it smell like? What does it feel like? Um, what sort of sense, uh, you know, do you see another person out of the frame? Um, you know, you can really put yourself in the scene using senses. And then from there, imagine the 15 seconds or so before and after the image and, and move, keep moving. Have your students move around for 30 seconds as if they were this subject after really thinking about all of the things that this subject is going through. And then revisit the question, what do you think the subject is thinking? Next, if you're gonna have them go as far as make a video, if you wanna take it even further, uh, you can recreate the scene and figures with body props, settings, or outfits. So here I have a photo of a man standing up painting a ceiling, but he's standing on this board that actually looks like it's about to break. Um, so when you're thinking about filming yourself doing this, where could you go? You know, um, I mean, first off, you would have to figure out how you're going to film it. So you know, is it with a smartphone, computer, tablet? Do you have a flat surface? Is it a tripod? Is it a stack of books? Is it up against the wall? You know, how are you, what are you going to do in, as far as how to film it? And if you have your students working in groups, maybe one of them has a camera or skills with a camera that the others don't. So you could really utilize group work to, to achieve this project also. Um, where will you film? Is it outside? Is it inside? Is it a quiet or a well-lit area? Um, you know, what is, what props are you going to need? You know, I see a bucket of paint here and I see a brush. What are you going to use for that? And then how will you step inside the shot? So what is the frame? How is the, the camera positioned with your body? So it can take some, you know, trial and error to try to figure out how to do that. So then once you've got the scene set, you've got your props, you've got your outfits, you've really thought about what that subject is going through, then it's time to, to take action, right? So uh, I'm going to share with you my example of bringing this uh, painter to life, and I'll talk about it as I'm playing it. But you'll see that I have this bucket at the bottom. I am very serious. And one of the things that I noticed when I started standing like this man is that his left arm is really, really um, firm. The way he, he's holding it, you can tell it's because he's trying to balance on this really small piece of wood. And I probably wouldn't have thought about that unless I really um, acted out what he's doing. And then you see, I have a hairbrush that I'm using as the brush. And I look really serious because <laughs> I'm trying to really hold my balance in the way that I think that he would. 
Um, but for this scene, I just put my phone on the floor face above me. I, I sort of took, I was all by myself. I didn't have anybody. And I did put a black and white filter for effect, but you wouldn't have to do that. And, um, you know, I learned a lot about what it must be like to work on top of this board that was probably wiggling while he was leaning back, you know, up and down because I was even trying to pretend that my feet were just on a really small square footage and it was still doing that. So I learned a lot about how this person might feel based on this activity. So you could have your students share the video with each other uh, in class, or you could have them all add it to a PowerPoint presentation like I have right now, or there's other social media platforms that they could add it to if you want to take that route. Um, so now that you've gotten through all of these steps, uh, and we've really uh, based a lot of this learning on our prior knowledge and our personal experience with this work of art, um, I think it's important to take the work of art into context. So whether you take your students all the way through to doing the video, or if you decide that you just want to move with them in class and that's as far as you take it, it might be a good idea to revisit this step too um, and really finish it out to really put this, this uh, experience that they've now uh, really brought into fruition of the subject into a greater context. And that's also an easier way to connect it to your curriculum or a way to, again, build on skills and content learning. So you could think about what major events are happening during this time period. You know, the early 20th century, there was the Great Depression. There, the last photo I showed you was taken in 1940, where there was a lot of major events happening as far as labor laws and um, workers' rights and things like that. So it would really touch on a lot of those things. Um, you could also look at what circumstances the subject are facing during the time. So what's the identity of this person? Where did they come from? Sometimes you can find information about that if you do some more uh, research. And then who is the photographer? You know, what, what was their intention? What, what other things did they do? That might give you some more information about the greater context of what's going on. And then also what's happening in the location where the photo was taken. You know, if this photo was taken in London, it might have a different context than if it was taken in New York or the cotton field picker that I showed you. That would be a different context if it was in the South than in California, probably. And also what time period it was taken. So once you sort of take this photo into a greater context, then you revisit the question. What do you think about the image? That could be a writing assignment. That could be a discussion. Maybe you have that question revisited after they create the video, they do the research after, and then they do that. It could be, you could build it out into a final project. And then I also don't want to limit this idea to just photography, right? Because that means that you only have a certain time period that you can connect to. So I did include some other works of art that you might be able to include to connect it. So for example, Triton riding a tortoise, you know, you could connect it to mythology, a man with a hoe, that's earlier work that you wouldn't be able to capture with a photograph or, you know, the life of a worker or a farmer. Um, and then, you know, an illuminated manuscript with a completely mythical situation and very gestural story. So maybe that would be an opportunity to connect to a popular story or a narrative. Uh, and then the musical group on the balcony, you know, maybe it's about daily life of this time period. So that concludes my presentation. And so I would like to hand it back over to Rebecca. And I think we're going to start our Q&A se section. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Darcy. That was really fun. We've had a lot of great comments in the Q&A. Um, I'd like to go ahead and, yes, get our Q&A started. Um, we have about 10 minutes or so um, to answer any questions that have come in, or if you have any that you haven't um, sent us yet, please feel free to go ahead and enter it now into the Q&A. Um, our presenters, Darcy and Elliot, if you'd like to go ahead and turn on your cameras so that we can see you, I will go ahead and pull up some of the questions. 
Um, so, uh, so one question that we had, um, I'll go ahead and read it out and perhaps both of you may have um, some thoughts about how you'd like to, maybe both of you would like to answer it. Um, we had one comment and question. It said, I like see, think, wonder and other visual prompts to get into a piece of work, but are there ways to deepen the learning and writing about art so that they may write an essay or a work of, about on a work of art? I have yet to see many that do more than surface learning and I teach high school. So I think the question is, um, and maybe Darcy, if you'd like to start, um, I think the question to summarize, the question is how can you deepen some of the learning once you've visually analyzed a work of art? And I know that this question came in before you had presented. So I know that you did just share some ways that you can deepen the learning. But I wonder if, as you were thinking about the project that you presented, whether you had any other um, thoughts or other ideas that didn't make it into your presentation, whether you might be able to share some of those ideas. <laughs> hmm. uh, <laughs> um, well, yeah, I think putting the, the work of art into a greater context, I mean, it could be something like create a timeline of all the events that were happening and then when that work of art what you know happened when did that uh, when did the artist make it or what time period is it capturing um i mean a, a lot of reflective writing about how it, it for the project that i presented you know really i mean you could create a diary for that uh that character or that person in the work of art um I think you could probably build out the video idea even more. I know kids today, they like to film themselves doing things and recreating things. So it might be, you know, you, you build that out. Maybe they do a video of what that person was going through five years later or something like that. So you could build out some of the ideas that I presented into a greater, longer project. All right, thanks. Um, I would just say that it kind of depends on the kind of what you are trying to learn about. So most of my career has been focused on learning about the art. And I think um, a lot of the things that we've suggested are kind of ways to get engaged initially. But once you've done that, I think it becomes a kind of um, a question of what the students themselves want to know about the artwork or the situation surrounding it. So I think the research for me um, has to be driven by the questions that the students themselves raise. And that once you've formulated the question or um, the questions that you wanna pursue, then it would be um, uh, the whole class's project to really pursue those questions, whether it's additional research or writing or whatever, whatever way that you want, want to um, take it. Okay, thanks so much, both Darcy and Elliot. Um, so let's see, I don't see too many other questions. Um, I do see a couple of sort of more technical questions about how to access some of these ideas about the fact that there were a lot of ideas that we just presented. So I just want to reiterate that in the Google Drive shared folder that we have included in the chat and which we'll also send you the link for in a follow-up um, email, um, you can find in there the slide deck that was used, which has all of the images that we discussed. And we also have an accompanying file that um, lists what each of those images is and includes a link um, that you can click on to find a high resolution download for that image in case you'd like to use any of those images in your own way. Um, so that, uh, let's see. Oh, here's one more new question. Okay, so we have one question. Um, and I'm gonna start direct this one first to Monica and then I think Elliot may have some ideas as well. Um, do you have any specific activities or artwork for all virtual kindergarten students? Were you wow. directing that at me or Elliot? <laughs> Let's start with Darcy. 
Okay. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of the artwork that Rebecca presented at the beginning um, could be done, things that call for a lot of sensory um, and, you know, movement. I think you can, I, at least in the sessions that I've taught with kindergartners, when you get them to stand up and pretend to do a lot of things using the imagination to, like I think about Elliot's work of art of like actually walking through the path and maybe even bending down and really um, activating the movement and the imagination together. Um, but I'll, I'll pass it over to Elliot because I'm sure he <laughs> has some other ideas. Well, I, th I think um, uh, what I would recommend is that um, you really have fun um, on our website or any museum's website, because the Getty has thousands and thousands of artworks. And to be honest, I think, you know, you know, there, there are probably a thousand that you could use for whatever purpose you wanted, but you, you just have to kind of like work your way through and explore the website. I was thinking about this before the webinar and you have to kind of learn how to, to ask the website for things you want. But for example, um, when you go to our website, there's a, um, a, a inquiry line and you could put in all kinds of things. You could put in things like clouds or you could put in mountains or you could put in mathematics or you could and just see what comes up and you'll be surprised what comes up because like a million things come up. So the, um, you know, the Getty Museum is actually just a medium, medium sized museum, but it has thousands of things. And so just take a little while it, and, and it's actually really fun just to explore in as many ways as you can think of the different kinds of things that you might find there. And you'd be surprised. I think you could probably find things for practically anything you wanted to teach. So that, that would be my recommendation. Okay, and then we had one question that was asked that I wanted to just share, which was, um, and I'll go ahead and answer this one, which was, are all the pieces of art used today from the Getty Museum? And so the answer is yes. Um, for the purposes of this webinar, we drew specifically from the Getty's collection. Um, that's largely because we know that collection very well since we all work at the Getty Museum. Um, but that's not to say that um, you're limited, you would be limited by using the Getty's collection. Just as Elliot mentioned, um, we think a lot of works of art from museums all around the country and all around the world work really well for these types of activities. And um, some other museums have other works in their collections that we don't have. So uh, it's it's really fun if you have the time. Nobody has time, but if you have the time, as Elliot mentioned, it's really fun to surf museum websites and find what works of art they have on their website. So certainly feel free to move beyond the Getty collection, although we hope that we've curated a helpful jumping off point for you today. Can I add something to that, Rebecca? Yes, absolutely. Also, I think for documenting a moment of time or looking at, you know, a documentary photograph, you can find a lot of those in your textbooks. Um, so even if you're really, you know, in a pinch and, you know, you haven't had time to really research for an image, you could look at um, materials that you're already using and try some of these techniques with those too. Great. Thank you. Um, so I think we've pretty much got answered most of the questions, except for a few that I'll, I'll cover in my wrap up. I'm going to take one last quick look here. Um, um, there, there was one question about um, what we have planned, um, whether we're running our um, former program called Summer Institute this summer. And um, unfortunately, no, because of um, the uncertainty about whether we can be gathering in person this summer because of the pandemic, um, we're not going to be offering any of those in-person programs this summer. Um, however, um, we'll certainly be thinking through what we'll be offering in the future. Um, and I encourage you to either join our mailing list or keep your eye on our website. Those are the two main places that we announce new programs. Um, let's see. 
All right, so I think that's just about everything. So we can go ahead and wrap up the Q&A. Thank you everybody for your questions. Thanks Darcy and Elliot um, for assisting with answering. Um, and to wrap up for the day, uh, I'd like to just thank everybody for joining us for your amazing questions and engagement. Um, I also wanted to let you know, I'll go ahead and give it to you in writing as well. I'd like to let you know about our final webinar program for this academic year. It's coming up in two weeks on Wednesday, May 5th. Um, and we will be highlighting um, our resource that focuses on photography called Getty Unshuttered. Um, we, we're, because the Unshuttered um, program uh, focuses on using an app, um, we and social media in some cases, we gear this content for grade six to 12 teachers, but there's a lot of photography resources that are great for elementary teachers as well. So we encourage everybody to join us. Um, we also, as usual, would love to hear your thoughts, your ideas, your suggestions for future webinars. Um, so we'd love it if you would reach out to us via our teacher programs email at the bottom of this slide to let us know your thoughts. Um, we will also be sharing with you a survey. Um, we'll be seeing that link pop up in the chat momentarily if it, if I've missed, if it's not there yet. Um, and we'll also um, be, we've programmed your Zoom to pop up the survey. If you access Zoom today from your browser, the survey will also pop up for you at the close of this webinar. Um, if for any reason you have trouble accessing it, we'll also be sending the survey out um, following the webinar via email. Um, we really would love your feedback. Please answer the survey if you can take a few moments. It doesn't have a lot of questions. Um, we also are giving away our complimentary book, Ready, Set, Go, The Kinesthetic Classroom. Um, and if you'd like to re receive a free copy of this book, um, when you complete your survey and push the submit button, you'll see a link pop up, which provides you with a form by which you can provide us with your mailing address to request the book. And so once again, when you complete your survey and submit it, you'll get a link to give us your mailing address for the free book giveaway. So last but not least, I'd like to thank everybody who has joined us for many, we see many familiar faces. We thank you for joining us repeatedly over the months. We love getting to know you virtually um, and we hope to continue to see you in the future. So thank you all again for attending today's webinar. Have a great evening.